How many of you know how Paychex's name was formed, our company name? Probably you kind of know his family's name, right? But you don't know the real story. Do you want to hear the real story? Yeah. All right. So when you think about Paytex, we get my wife's name is Pam, and the kids in descending order of age in our family are Adam, Eric, Tessa, and my son. This is my last name, right? Now we had probably 18 names picked up, uh, but they all get bounced by the trademark search because when we started in '98, we wanted to really have a name that was national because we thought ultimately we we had that dream to go national. So our first name was Polaris Communications. The scientific name of the North Star, or in Rochester, it's cold, obviously, it's up north. Uh, one of the early investors was Star Telecom, so we thought Polaris. Right? So the um, problem was there was an internet provider in the Midwest that had that name. So I called up the Buckaroo, okay, I said, hey, you know, he had like two employees and three customers. And that's when you know, the URLs and website addresses that were going for like half a million bucks in 98. I said, how much for the name for Polaris? And he said, half a million dollars. And I went, don't think so. See you later. So we came up with all these other names, all got bounced. They all had you know, different companies already had them. So we had two of our founding employees that started, uh, Molly and Kathy. And they actually, uh, when they quit their job, they brought one of those you know, brown boxes and they put everything in. They had this little $3 bottle of really bad white Zinfandel that they got from some vendor. So they started drinking in the middle of the day. We were three weeks old in the company's history. But we needed a name to get follow the public service commission so we could start billing long distance for local <coughs> telephone rooms. So they got a little loopy at four o'clock in the afternoon after a couple of glasses and they started spelling uh, my family. The problem was my youngest was uh, four months, my wife was four months pregnant. We didn't know if it was a boy or girl. So they said, Ernest, we want you to go home tonight and talk to Pam and we want you to name your unborn child with the letter E. <laughs> <laughs> that's not easy. So, that's not easy. so um, went home that night, you know, how you're sitting in uh, wife's reading. I bring out that, that book from, you know, names A to Z, okay? And I just coincidentally had it open to the letter E. And, and I go, man, there's some really cool names on this page. And she doesn't even look up. She's just reading her book. Uh, she goes, well, I, I've always loved Emma. I go, Emma? <laughs> Shit, really? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden, I said, how a boy's name? I got nothing. So we found out three days later, had the ultrasound with the doctor, found it was a girl, bingo bango, Emma. <laughs> so to this day, Emma still thinks she was named after some Disney princess. <laughs> <laughs> Little does she know, we just did it because we need a, we need a second last letter. Here we go. So um, this is going to be Q&A, no PowerPoints, no slides, no nothing, free flowing. What do you want to talk about? How you get started? Spun off after at and How you get started? Um, okay. My first job out of college was an engineer at the Rochester Telephone. I worked down Sibley Tower, went to Midtown for lunch all the time. Very kind of ironic when you think about it now. And um, worked there for three years. Uh, my boss went to a company called ACC that was headquartered and founded in Rochester. It was a long distance sort of competitor at AT&T. So I worked there for 11 years, did different jobs in the US and around the world. And then when our company, that ACC, was bought in 97 by AT&T. And usually it takes about five months for all the regulatory process and FCC approval process from the time you sign a deal to the time you close. So during that, that window, um, AT&T made it pretty clear to many of us that they didn't want us to hang out. And so I was on the board at the time, and I thought, well, I finally learned how to play golf for the first time and take a year off and get paid my severance. And what turned out, um, AT&T chose not to want to pay our severance as part of the transaction deal. So they were basically encouraging all 40 officers in four countries to go compete with them. And I said, I don't really want to do that, but you know, okay. Um, so basically I was out of work and I didn't have a paycheck. So that's how I started paying. Um, I wasn't sure it was going to be a telecom company, but what ended up happening is as part of that AT&T not paying our severance, um, we have our not competes and not solicits eliminated. So here they go, at and pays $1.1 billion for a company, it's in four countries, you know, 1,500 people, and they take all the officers and say, you're free to go compete with us. I love at and I mean, that's, that's, you know, usually when you buy a company, you say, you're either gonna work for me or you're gonna sit at home, but you're not gonna go do other things. So that's how we get started. And um, just uh, along the lines of, you know, how, how did you get started with certain partners? Usually it's two buddies in a garage together. Well, there were, out of 1,500 ACC employees in 98, 
There were 375 in the U.S. We were headquartered in Rochester. So the first 60, 90 days when we started the company, I just interviewed people. So, you know, what do you want to do? How do you want to run the business? What, what thoughts do you have? And so I interviewed 75 people in the first 90 days. And out of 75 people, two stayed at AT&T, two went to a different startup locally here in town, and 71 joined us. So I had 71 or 75 people. I thought we'd get like a dozen. <laughs> and, you know, when we had 71, I had to tell them, like, take a couple weeks off for vacation because we didn't have any money yet. You know, we just had our AT&T stock. Um, but as you know, everything starts with people, good people, solid people. And these are folks I've worked together at Rochester Telephone ACC for on and off 15, 20 years. And who gets a chance like that to start an entire business from scratch with the best people of all the departments at all levels that you know and trust and love? And sometimes it's just good to be lucky. So a little luck, a little stupidity on AT&T's part, and that's how we get started. So not too complicated. Maybe a little more complicated. But that's kind. Of. What else? We got an hour, guys. So you got to be getting better. Yeah. Yes. How did you manage to keep uh, the employee base that you have motivated, especially with the recent economic downturn and recent layoffs? Um, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> maybe that's not a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think if it starts first with communications. Uh, we have uh, a lot of different things we try to do to keep all the employees aware of what's going on. So we do everything from every, almost every Friday at 11.30 Eastern time, we'll have a company-wide uh, conference call. And it used to be just a little audio call when we first started the company. Now it's you know 4,000 people with video screens across the country and all 84 markets that we do business in. And we go for about 20, 25 minutes, we talk about you know, stuff in the news that may hit the press as long as it's not an SEC violation that we're telling them ahead of time. Um, a little bit easier when you're private that way. We talk about um, financial issues, operational issues, good stuff, bad stuff, recognition, um, and we usually tell a very lame joke at the end. Um, and when we were like smaller and private, our jokes were a little on the letterman edge. Now they have to tend to be like, you know, eight o'clock, you know, PG kind of edge, but to a um, first, it's just communication. You got newsletters, you got conference calls, you got video calls. But you just want to make, make, <coughs> make sure that everyone feels as much in the know as possible. As an example, like with the um, Midtown project, um, anytime I wanted to leak something to the press, I would actually tell our employees on a Friday call four weeks ahead of time. Because there's always some employee's husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend that tells a friend in the press or something. And then they would find it. But the, the point is, our employees knew first before everything else. Okay. And when you're going through tough economic times, the last thing people want to believe that you're doing is wasting money and spending money on all new stuff instead of their jobs and careers and health care premiums for their family. <coughs> um, so as long as you're communicating what you're doing, why you're doing it, that's important, first step. Second step is they want to know that you got your priorities in the right place, right? So if you're doing things like uh, having uh, senior officer retreats in Tahiti for mm -hmm. annual planning junkets, that would be a bad thing to do. Okay. Um, when you're talking about doing layoffs, I mean, back in the end of 2008, we probably had oh, 250 layoffs. <coughs> you know, 3,500 employees. Um, we could have done 500. But then you would have really been putting a lot of people through much more pressure and anxiety in their family and, and their personal situation. And you know, for a momentary pop in the stock price, save a little bit extra money, wasn't as important as keeping all those people together and employed until we sort of worked our way out of it. Um, but it wasn't just the folks that had entry level jobs that got laid off. Um, a higher percentage of the senior executives and the VPs and the managers got laid off and their positions eliminated and combined, then folks who actually have the entry-level jobs that do a lot of the day-to-day -day, you know, direct work in engineering or customer service or some or IT. Um, so again, it's, it's not just any one thing. It's hundreds and hundreds of things you do every day that give people the impression that you care about them, you have your priorities straight, and they understand and are aware of what's going on. Um, we told people we were going to uh, cut back on 401k match employer match for a while. 
uh, for our company that's $6 million a year. And uh, we did this uh, for two years, the last downturn we were in, uh, in 2001, 2002, and we said as soon as we can, we bring it back. The last time that happened, was, uh, happened, we brought it back first to the people that made less money than the executives. Uh, and what we did is we were giving out uh, a million dollars in a match this, this coming month uh, to the people that are considered by the IRS lower compensated than highly compensated for the purposes of the 401k. Um, and again, so it's, it's an example of, you know, people that don't get as much stock options and equity are going to be getting uh, an employer 401k match or the other executives don't get it. So again, it's, I mean, I go out for days on stuff like that, but if people feel that you're on their side and uh, you're treating them fairly, then you got a shot at keeping your morale there. Um, but in a tough economic time, it's sort of like neutral or negative. It's going to suck or suck less, basically, okay? <laughs> and you don't want to be in the bottom category. So you just try to get through it with everyone. Thank you. Sure. It's a great question. I mean, that's, 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 we could spend a whole hour just talking about techniques like that. Okay. Where do you think that philosophy of the way you treat your workers comes from? The philosophy? Yeah, where does that, does that, where does that come from? Um, well, a lot of us who started the company, yeah, those 71 people, you know, we've kind of seen good things and bad things in our lives before, but um, I don't know, where does anything come from? You know, it comes from your family, your, the way you're raised, your parents, the environment, I suppose. Um, but it, 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 it's kind of like common sense, right? Most things in business are common sense. Um, if you treat people well with respect, they're going to respond accordingly. You treat them like dirt, they're going to you know, not be loyal to you. So I, mean, I, I guess, where does it come from? Uh, what would someone say? What would Dean Zupan say? <laughs> he would say something um, very eloquent that actually sounded really good. Um, but it, ultimately, it makes more money for you. If you treat people well and you treat them with respect and they feel connected to you, you're going to have better performance, which will translate hopefully to happier customers, happier customers, better paying customers, uh, smarter operations, and you should make more money. So being nice and caring isn't about being a, you know, a jerk or stupid or, or soft. It's about being greedy bastards that we all are. <laughs> and when you're nice, you make more money at it. You really do, ultimately. It's a little weird philosophy, right? <laughs> be nice to be greedy. Yeah? How about mentors? Have you had any great mentors? I, do you have any advice for young people looking for mentors? I've had great mentors. My first uh, manager out of college was a gentleman named Tanganatra. And he was uh, like a crazy uh, uh, person that had immigrated here from Uganda many years ago. And uh, so he, he uh, took me under his wing and worked for him for six months. And at that point, there was like a management program at Rasha Telephone where every six months you go to different jobs. <coughs> so in two years, I had four different bosses in different areas, got to know a ton of the people at Rasha Telephone. And um, then when I, when I went through that whole cycle, he got promoted and I got to take his job, which was kind of bizarre. So when you actually, when you take your mentor's job the way he wanted it done a certain anal kind of way, <laughs> be very careful about that sometimes. But it was really fun. Then he quit and left me and went to work for ACC. And then he went through all his friends. They all turned it down. Then he finally asked me and that's how I went over to ACC. <coughs> how did that mentorship begin? He actually, it was funny, um, there were about 15 people in the management program and he and all of the certain managers had a chance to take a look and they, they selected who they wanted based on the bio and the profile. So, so he, he picked me out of a, just a bio list, which was interesting. Um, usually you don't get that lucky. Usually you have to like beg, bar, and steal to try to go get a mentor who will work with you, who's, you know, who you, you sort of have a connection with. I got extremely lucky. But then, you know, along the way, there's other people that help you. Um, Rick Abb, who was the founder of ACC, and, um, you know, he taught me a lot. And then those two gentlemen, Tan and Rick, while I was working at ACC, started a company in, South, or in, uh, in the Carolinas called US Life. And then nine years later, we bought their company. And we all got, we're reunion, re reunited again. And now they're still on the board of directors of Paytech. And Saturday, <coughs> Tan and Rick and I, go to Mumbai for the first sort of, you know, trip to India on Paytech's behalf to start 
uh, looking at creating operations over there. That's kind of full circle, right? Was that 26 years ago we started together? Mm -hmm. Man, you pick your mentors correctly. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that's a really good point. I, you know, we have a program at Paytech where we uh, put together, we sort of force mentoring. Uh, every year we have a leadership development program where we take every senior executive, we have 20 of them, uh, and 20 vice presidents and 20 directors, and we match all of them up into a one-year program. So I had a, a, a vice president from Philadelphia, and then he had a, a, a director of operations from Iowa, and so the three of us were kind of in the little lineup together, and they, it's a year-long program where they work on projects and work together across uh, across departments, across regions, get to know each other that way, and then we all get together, all 60 of us in the summer for a couple of days, and we're about to start a whole new brand, brand new program of the leadership participants, and if you cycle through it after five years, we'll have gone through the entire organization, then we'll cycle it again. Uh, and you kind of hope some of those mentoring relationships stick, uh, and it turns out that, that they do. You know, you spend a lot of time uh, every other week, every month, talking to people and visiting them face to face. Eventually, they become friends or just you know confidants of each other, and it's really helped um, uh, develop stronger bonds across the, the country. So you can you can absolutely force mentoring if you want to. It's kind of like uh, speed dating, I suppose, but uh, <laughs> you, you can't do it. Is that okay? Yes, sir. What's your uh, favorite part of Paytex culture? Favorite part of Paytex culture? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I like the community service part of this. Um, we, we encourage all the employees and the officers to get involved. And um, there's nothing like um, seeing people's eyes light up when they're doing <coughs> something. They're telling you a story about what they did for you know, the, uh, the homeless shelter in Nashville, Tennessee and they raised $1,400 and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we don't, try to, we don't try to tell people, these are the three charities of the corporate charities, mm -hmm. you know, that you know, Paytech does Habitat for Humanity or does something else. You just let every officer kind of go the way they're gonna go, whatever they're personally passionate about, whatever they spend their own uh, family's money and time on, and we'll match it 50-50. So <coughs> if you're a vice president in Atlanta and you spend two grand every year personally on a particular charity, we'll match the two grand. But we also encourage you to join the board of directors and get involved and we'll put some, some muscle behind sort of organized events there. <coughs> but just let all the people chase what they're really passionate about and you'll get 10 times more than if you just told people, we're doing it right away and that's it. Um, so I, I love seeing that kind of stuff, I really do. And I love seeing the, um, the kids and the relatives of our employees get involved in those activities. And every, um, every week in our company newsletter, there's usually two or three um, projects or events that we all get to read about and see you know, what other people around the country are doing uh, on the community service side. So. Can, you, yeah. sorry, can you talk about how you foster that um, philanthropy and community service for people when they don't feel as though they have the resources or the time to be involved? Um, yeah, it's tough. Um, you, you can't you can't force people to do it. Um, you know, some things you can use with a stick to get people going. Uh, community service you can't use a stick. And and what we find doesn't it, you're not trying to work it the best, but I think what helps is the fact that you're encouraging it. You really don't say it at the corporate level that we'd like you to do it, but then when the person asks for four hours off in the afternoon, their supervisor says we really can't spare you because we're busy. You really have to encourage it across the board. And you have to talk about it in a really fun, cool way. Like, you almost want to make it cool to be doing it. And if you're not doing it, it's not that you're, you're going to get in trouble. It's just if you're not doing it, you just you don't feel like you're part of the, the cool crowd. You know, I find sort of positive peer pressure, <laughs> clicks, everything works uh, much better in community service type stuff. Not always works in, in sort of every aspect of the job. but. Um, but it's really tough. People are pressured. I mean, they work at second jobs. They're doing all kinds of things with their families. Um, very difficult. Okay, work at it. Yeah. If you could give um, one piece of career advice to us, what would it be? 
One piece of career. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <clears throat> What's your name? Uh, Where are you from? China. Hmm. Okay. Case um, one piece of career. Um, I would say um, hmm. I think you got him with that one. <laughs> no, I got like five things right there. <laughs> I got like a hundred things. I really think if um, if you do what you love to do, truly, that's what you should do. You know, um, you'll be so good at something that you really enjoy doing because you want to do it, you want to learn about it, you'll be thinking about it all the time, you'll be compulsive, obsessive about it. Um, you just have to find what it is that you love to do. And it doesn't have to be a kind of business, it could be some, a type of activity involved in any kind of business. Uh, but just really <coughs> understand yourself and what you like to do. Because if you do it uh, unnaturally, you're not going to be as successful and you won't be as happy. And that's, that's, um, that really helped me a lot when I was, I mean, I went from a civil engineer to architecture to mechanical engineering to pre-med to this and that. And, that. and all, all the while I was in college, I was doing all these little sort of um, business little ventures on the side. I mean, I was selling Amway at the fraternity house in Boston. I was, I was doing all kinds of stuff. At the end of the day, I really loved business. I love starting something from nothing and getting it going, and, and I finally figured that out like uh, at the end of my senior year in college, and I said, okay, let me go find a place where they can just teach me about business, and that's why I came to Roster for that particular program at Roster Telephone, because I wasn't going to come here at all. It was like a crazy long shot here, and, I'll, and I'll, I look back on it, four kids born at Strong Hospital, I was married at the chapel, got my MBA here. I'm on the board of trustees here. I'm like your freaking poster child for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do what, right now I'm doing what I love to do. And I think that's, if, if you could find something you love, that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, what's your vision for transforming Rochester's downtown? <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, one of the reasons I came, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in a second. Um, one of the reasons I came to Rochester when I was interviewing senior year, I was a, it was in January, and there's a place right on Monroe when you're approaching sort of the Strong um, Museum. It used to be called the Glass Onion. I don't even know what it's called now. It's, it's still open as well. And it was a Monday night, cold in January, like 500 people in the place. Party, band, it was this band called Reporter, for those of us old enough to remember who that was. And it was like the prettiest girls. It was like, I was like, I was so happy. I was going, Rochester, Monday night, January? I'm coming to this town. This <laughs> Little did I know it was the 25th anniversary of the band, and it was just like a one-time show. <laughs> but, um, but back in the mid-'80s, I mean, it was a pretty interesting area, Park Avenue, and Rome, all this different stuff. Um, and um, it, it's not any one company, any one organization can help change downtown. It's many, many people working together. I love what ESL did to help fix up that corner, what Strong did. I love what some people are doing at High Falls. East End is great. It's exciting. I just wish everyone wasn't 16 and went there on Friday and Saturday night. <laughs> it's a little, a little disturbing in some ways. Um, but it's, uh, the problem is there's so many good little pockets everywhere. But when you go into the middle of town, it's like a big black hole, and it's, there's nothing going on there. Um, so to me, the most important part of getting things cooking again is helping to, to clear out that midtown area. Um, because you can't just say you're going to go do office buildings and retail, and then people will come. It all sort of happens simultaneously. You need a little bit more residents there, you need a little bit more shops, you need a little bit more office. You've got to just build it, you know, gradually. And I think 10 years from now, the town's going to be a really cool town. I really do. Uh, but you need 
You need bodies, you need activity. When the jazz festival goes on in the summer, no one's afraid of their safety. No one, everyone loves it. They're just walking around the streets up and down everywhere. It's because there's, there's life, there's activity, there's like hustle, bustle. We need people down there. And you can't just like tell a whole bunch of folks to go buy lofts and move down there when there's no stores to go shopping. Um, so it's gonna, it's gonna take a lot of work, but uh, I'm looking forward to our building. Very pumped up about that. We're gonna try to make it a little bit more fun. So we've got $250,000 lined up in the budget for advanced LED lighting on the outside of the building. So we're gonna make it different colors. So on St. Patty's Day, it's gonna look as bright as your sweater, okay? <laughs> and on you know Veterans Day, red, white, and blue, and little musical notes during festivals. And just make it funky. On the rooftop, there'll be uh, gardens and sort of catering areas. We'll have concerts and activities and events up there. Can the young leaders have an event there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they can. They're obviously done there. And so we have a deal with the, um, the jazz festival owners and the organizers that we're going to, um, June of 2013, when the building's done, and for that jazz festival, for every evening, there's nine, nine nights of the festival. The not-for-profits and the charities that don't have enough wherewithal to really raise money easily on, on their own. We're gonna host an event for each not-for-profit that has a paid tech board member, you know, it's engaged. And then we'll get some, you know, very inexpensive jazz artist who's already there for a different evening. You know, we'll, we'll pay like, you know, one third of what they normally get paid to do it, do something there. And then at the end of the evening from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m., all of the jam sessions for all the artists from the entire region will be there. Because that's what they usually do. They always sort of go to one bar or one hotel that they're hanging out in, and they get to know each other, and they just, they just you know, play music or talk or whatever. And so we're going to have a nice catering kind of thing up there every night. And for the people that give a lot of money to people, those charities, during those uh, events, they get invited up, customers will get invited up, prospects of potential employees will get asked up there, right? And uh, I mean, we just want to make it a really fun place to be. And the retail on the first floor in the building is going to be fun. We're, gonna talk. we're already talking to all the other folks in the area about what they're going to do. Just so we all don't have like 12 coffee houses and nothing else. I mean, that'd be kind of boring. But I do think a Wegmans or that kind of store will go down there. Like sort of a, a Whole Foods or a Dean and DeLuca or something like that. A little athletic club on the second floor so you can stare out to the, to the outside like you do in Manhattan. Um, I think there's a good shot at the Performing Arts Center. And that, that'll be massive if we could get something like that. I mean, I don't know how many of you have been to the Auditorium Theater. It's a nice place, but it's old, and it's, they can't hold all the different events that want to come here. Um, one of the main reasons we don't uh, get as many conventions here is the convention center doesn't have sort of the auditorium or theater-style seating for bigger events. So you know, a lot of people walk away from this place as a, as a potential convention destination. So there's just a lot of things that that kind of midtown location uh, can help. Um, I love what Eastman's doing down there. I love. I mean, I love what a lot of people are doing. We just have to do more of it faster. So, I don't know if that answered your original question on the video. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. My parents actually asked me if I'd find them something downtown. I said, I, I, I know a few people. We can find, <laughs> find an apartment down there. So, yeah. So, how will this moving to downtown impact um, paychecks operating costs? Can you say that again? How will this moving to downtown um, mm -hmm. affect paychecks operating costs? How, oh, uh, how will it affect our operating costs? Yes. Oh, is good there question. Any, is there any synergy there from business point of view? Um, yes, there is. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I like that question. Thanks for, you know, you should give me $20 all right now. Um, a couple things. We're a big tenant of paycheck. We have four buildings we lease in Rochester for about 165,000 square feet. But a lot of it's wasted space because you're in four different places and common space is just not as efficient and it's not as good being not under the same roof for your company, especially if you're a service type of business. So we, um, we needed about 225 to 230,000 square feet, we thought, in one building would give us enough growth for a period of time plus it would make it very efficient. So since you're a tenant, and let's say, uh, these aren't the exact numbers, so don't quote me to the penny, but we spend about $4 million a year on rent and expenses for those places. If you were to build and own a 
230,000 square foot building in Midtown, as an example, uh, your operating costs and your principal and interest payment on your mortgages would be less than four million. It'd be somewhere around 3.2 million. So you save eight hundred thousand dollars potentially, and now instead of every single month your, you know, your cash goes out and you don't own anything at the end, you're building equity value by paying down principal on that building. So at the end of twenty year mortgage, and instead of owning nothing, you own the entire building yourself. And there's there's three real cool parts to um, uh, the, the Midtown project. Um, so let's say for right now it's a fifty million dollar project. The building. There's one piece that you get a HUD loan for three percent, three percent, three percent money. I love three percent money. Okay, but that's the loan that gets that sort of flows through the city, but the city doesn't have any responsibility for it. They just have to hold, you know, they hold the bag at the end if we go bankrupt. So yeah, if we go bankrupt, the city's burned. Okay, but that's that's about a third. Um, the other one is sort of your normal. M&T, First Niagara, pick whatever banks, that's your regular mortgage, so you're going to run like a 6% mortgage there. And then there's these, you know, new market tax credits. I love this stuff. Like if you're in a really depressed zone, okay, you can get tax benefits for it. Now, because we don't have, we have huge NOLs already as a company from previous losses and companies we've acquired, we don't need the tax shield. We're going to not be, you know, taxpayers for like five, six, seven, eight, ten years, whatever it is. Um, so new market tax rate. These things you can sell for like 68 cents on the dollar at the time uh, that you build your building. Um, so that's this is one of my most favorite words in the English language. <laughs> free. It's free. It's about 16 million dollars is going to be a gift to us, and we'll sell those tax credits to someone who can really use them, like a regional bank or something else. So one third, one third, one third. So immediately we're going to own one third of the building just for being, you know, really <coughs> nice guys. And putting up with the press. Where's the press? <laughs> <laughs> you. Um, and we'll probably put like $5 million into it for, you know, furniture and incidentals and everything else that you got to do. So it's a $55 million project when you all get down to it. So you're going to own the building at the end. You're going to get more space. You're going to be under one roof. You're going to get all the PR and exposure. <clears throat> I mean, like, if people don't know who Paytech is now after three years of Midtown, are they ever going to know who we are? <laughs> and it's going to keep going for another three years. Because the people in the press, they can't stop talking about it. It's the most phenomenal thing. It's a free marketing. It's, it's so, so free. Now, the problem is, if, if we don't build a nice building, they're going to trash talk us. So we have to make sure it looks pretty, you know, it looks tasteful. But we're going to put some, you know, uh, big flat screen TV, new technology, all that stuff on the outside. We're going to try to make it a really uh, fun place to be. Uh, we won't try to be as tacky as Times Square in New York City, but, <laughs> but it's fun to be in Times Square. You get to see, you see movement and lights and energy. How many times have you flown over the city at night? into the airport, it's like boring. Think about Miami, think about Dallas, think about these other places. We don't need to make it look like Vegas or anything, we just have to make sure it looks like it's not dead. <laughs> so there's a lot of actual financial reasons that make sense. Um, and that's ultimately where we came down to the parking issue, which was the one real popular piece of sort of uh, disagreement within the community. Um, so we decided that we could we could compromise with everything that we're saving um, to pay for our portion of the maintenance costs and upkeep of the, the percentage of parking spaces in the underground garage we were going to uh, hold on to, and so that seemed like a fair compromise. And usually, when you know most no one is happy and everyone's marginally pissed off, that means that was a good deal. <laughs> it was a fair deal. Yeah. Um, I find it fascinating with the whole Midtown project um, with the uh, economic impact on the city of Rochester. Um, however, I also find it intriguing um, the do not build list that you were able to uh, get the city to agree on. Mm -hmm. How were you able to get the city to agree on like IE parking lot or um, health clinic next to your new headquarters? Ah, good, good question. So, 
I love Texas Hold'em. You love, I, don't you love poker? Okay. <laughs> so the city, this was the city's hand. Okay, they had a pair of twos. <laughs> Paytech had. <laughs> You're doing pretty well. <laughs> so if the city said no, it, it was okay. Because we'd build a building somewhere else, we'd do something. I mean, there's a lot of different options we have. If you're if you're in upstate New York with this economy, and you tell people you want to build a 225,000 square foot building and put 1,200 jobs that average $83,000 in compensation, in high tech, you, you, you're going to have people like falling over you on how fast they can help you do stuff. So it was never going to be a problem. But at the end of the day, you can't have a 15-year project like the Renaissance Square project. You know, I'll be allowed to go on because it's a mixture of you know private money, public money, government money, political issues, different administrations, and 15 years later, you still got you know just a colored billboard on the corner. That's all you got. Um, and we weren't going to sit next to a piece of dirt for 15 years. So ultimately, it wasn't about us trying to restrict who gets to build there. We just want anything built. But what we don't want is people fighting about something and nothing happening for 10 years. Kind of like um, World Trade Center. I mean, that would be a, you know, just a horrible outcome for Paytech, having a nice brand new corporate headquarters we want to bring people to, and sitting next to a bunch of dirt and sort of you know, bombed out buildings next to us. So that's the reason we did it. But ultimately, if they didn't want to do it, we were going to walk. But we told them, the nice thing is, everything's in writing and documented and hand we wanted not to pay more than what we're paying today. We wanted parking free for the employees, and we wanted to have that, that joint uh, development right. And as long as we had those three things, we were good, and that's the handshake we had back in August of 2007. So we never wavered. So it's also good when you don't try to change the game on people. Then they don't feel like you're trying to pull a fast one. <coughs> and we never did. <coughs> yeah? Could you describe how your business, Paytech, specializes within telecommunications? What you do that the rest don't do? What you do better than the rest? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, we're like at and Verizon. Um, we all have the same, it's kind of like if you're a painter, you know, you've got the same paints and the brushes and the canvas that you know any other artist does, but then how come when you make something it's beautiful and a masterpiece and I make something and you couldn't give it away to flea market, right? It's, it's how the people would put all those things together. And I think we've done a nice job putting together a network for people that's, um, that's newer, um, it's easier to manage, it's got some nicer features to it, but ultimately it's the same stuff. We all buy from Cisco equipment, we all buy from other people, we all have fiber optic networks. Um, it's just you know how the artist puts it together a little bit differently. Um, but it's essentially the same stuff. But we're much more fun to do business with. <laughs> How widely distributed is your business? You're operating in North Carolina? And we're, we're nationwide. We're in 86 of the top 100 MSAs. Uh, we'll do two billion in sales this year, about 4,700 employees, um, about 100,000 commercial <coughs> customers. We focus mostly on business clients. Um, it's tough to fight you know, the whole wave on the consumer side. I mean, if you're not the wireless provider, the cable provider, or the, the bell company, you, you really can't do consumer very easily. But uh, medium large business, Good place to be. Pays the bills. The nice thing is, you know, we're probably one percent market share in the country for our target market, and we're two billion in sales. So where else can be like one percent market share? Maybe two billion. So we go to two percent market share, we'll be four billion. So let AT and T and Verizon, all those big folks, do what they're going to do. We just we're like um, we're like a scavenger. We just feed off their scraps. <laughs> and do fine. Yeah. Can you explain how uh, Paytech and the telecommunications industry measures uh, you know, financial success? You know, for example, looking at uh, EBITDA versus you know just uh, profit and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, um, our our in our particular industry, because so many people don't have net income right. and have gone through bankruptcy, uh, EBITDA tends to be the measure of valuation. So it's usually a multiple of EBITDA, and that sort of equalizes everyone. Um, you know, when we bought the last couple of companies, uh, because they had already depreciated a lot of their fiber assets, we had to you know, go through that accounting process where now we have to 
put back a whole bunch of depreciation amortization in our P&L. Yeah. So all of a sudden it sort of inflated our losses. So if you look at our free cash flow numbers, levered free cash flow, after you paid your know, interest in principal, um, not just EBITDA minus CapEx, and you look at your EBITDA um, sort of, uh, trends, um, we're doing pretty well. Um, Revenue is a really weird metric to use in our industry. It's uh, it's usually it's usually multiples of EBITDA. That's how you should look at it. Yeah. I really um, the the culture you've created in your company of your employees giving back to the community. I think it's fantastic. What experience did you have maybe in your life that kind of crystallized that importance to give back? Well, um, it's a good question. My uh, my parents came from Lithuania as refugees uh, after World War II, so they were in displaced, you know, refugee camps in Germany for four years, and then they came to this country in 1948. And my grandparents were doing really well before the war, and after the war they came to the U.S. and you know, one one grandmother was a seamstress for you know seven days a week, 12 hours a day. One was a person that cleaned fish in the fish market in Baltimore in the Inner Harbor, which, by the way, as she got promoted, we always got really good. You know, crabs and you know, <laughs> <laughs> went down so it didn't work out too badly. But you know, they had to start from scratch. And then my parents learned to speak English. <coughs> you know, teenagers in the U.S. They both went to University of Maryland, got, got degrees there. You know, did the whole army thing, got a job at GE, put three kids through college, and just, you know, the whole American program. Um, but when you go through that, you really do appreciate because most of our relatives were killed in World War II or in, sent to Siberia by the communists or present by the Nazis or whatever, whatever fun group you want to talk about in World War II. Um, and it does, it does sort of put things in perspective for you, so I, I'm sure it came from the family. Was there a first instance where like you did something on your own, some volunteer experience or something where it was you doing it and no longer was just part of your Yeah, family? yeah, no. Um, the first like really weird community service thing I ever did. Um, I told my dad, I mean, well, I'll, I'll tell you two stories. Okay, the, the real story is um, we were sitting, a bunch of us in the fraternity house, freshman year, and we wanted to create, we had, me and my roommate had both gotten little brothers. And between Harvard and MIT, Cambridge at that point was like a slum. It was like one of the worst places, neighborhoods in the country. Now it's not so bad, but before it was pretty bad. So he and I have got two little brothers, and we were talking about all the, their friends, they were just like not doing anything on a Saturday in the neighborhood. We were always like, did pickup games with them. So I said, why don't we just go create an NCAA event and have thousands of young kids, friends of theirs, just at MIT in a stadium for an afternoon. <coughs> and we looked at each other and we actually had both had about a six pack each and it sounded really good at the time. So then we set up and we were sober the next day and we said, okay, let's go do it. So um, we got the local McDonald's franchisees to give us all the food for the day. We went to the university, they said yes. We got you know, local suppliers to give us all the medals and all the stuff. And then, very wise, we combined our efforts with multiple all-women's universities in the local area. <laughs> very wise move. Because um, then we could attract the guys to help us do the stuff. It's like, right. mm -hmm. perfect. Um, and that was it, and we had like, I don't know, 2,000 people for some event, you know, at, on a Saturday with all those people with free food. Then the fun part was the extra food we had. There was always extra food we gave it up. But then he and I went on a subway ride throughout all Boston, throughout the all the tea, right. and we had bags of cheeseburgers with us from the donations. So we went to all like the homeless little spots in the subways underground, right. and we were giving out cheeseburgers. And you would have thought we were like, I mean, like the Excellent. best people out there. Oh my gosh. And I still remember that to this day, how something that little, that simple, made a big deal to someone's life. Just the fact you would care enough to do that. Right. And, and plus, we actually got to meet a lot of cool girls. So that was pretty <laughs> <cool>. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I believe that uh, every individual should uh, do his career to have made some decision that changes everything. Uh, do, you, do you have any uh, examples of that? Assuming that you did, how did you weigh the risks? And the oh, like a decision that changed everything? Yes. Um, wow. Um, well, we had a chance to sell Paytech 
1998, six months after we started, before we had any customers, and we were offered to sell the business for $75 million. Just because of our business plan and those 71 people we hired, because the peop some, someone really knew that we were going to do good with that group of people. And, um, and when you looked at the unvested stock options for some of the people, I was going to do fine, some of the other guys were going to do fine, but there was still like, I thought it should have been 80 million to really treat everyone the same. And the person who wanted to buy us only gave 75. I said, God, I mean, your company's worth 2 billion. I'm talking 75 to 80 so the other people can get their, their stock out because they, they quit their job and started with us. And, um, and they said no. And I said, what? And I was thinking about it. If, if that's the way they're treating this kind of decision, which is really meaningless. I mean, I would have given it out of myself, but I just thought that if that's who we're going to be, you know, sort of linking our, you know, future success to, that's not the kind of personality I necessarily want to do something with. So I turned it down, and it's kind of, kind of good that it did, because they're definitely we wouldn't be having a paycheck midtown conversation right now. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, we we almost sold the company back then. So yeah, there's always times like that where you look back and it could have gone one way or the other. Can you speak to uh, Paytech's philosophy on customer satisfaction and customer uh, experience? Mm -hmm. um, is there a formal program in place? Uh, how is it measured? Uh, how far uh, does it go up in the ranks? Yeah, 20% um, of my bonus and every bonus in the company for all the employees is measured on customer satisfaction. And we, you, there's a lot of good ways to do it. You just got to pick one way. We use the Net Promoter Score system that GE and some other people use. So essentially, if you're not familiar with it, you get a score of one out of 10 from your uh, customer. And if you get a score from one to six, you're kind of thought of as, you know, that's a, that's a negative. You're, they, 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 they're called a detractor. Uh, if you get a nine or 10 score, they're kind of a supporter or sponsor. And seven or eight is kind of neutral. It's like, eh. Um, so you add up all the sevens and eights versus the ones to sixes versus the nines and tens, and you get your NPS score. So um, that's pretty, it's pretty straightforward, right? Most people could say, like, how good are you, scale one to 10? Am I satisfied customer? It's a pretty simple question, right? Would you recommend me to a friend or whatever kind of version or something like that? And um, it seems to work pretty well. You know, when you ask someone for one number versus 30 questions on a survey, and you're just like, it's way too, it's too much effort. Do you like me, do you not like me? Would you buy from me again? Would you not? It's it's really basic, and, uh, and then you can cut right to the, the core of the problem that they're having. Yeah. What what advice would you give to someone who wants to start a new business? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say if you haven't really worked in that area in that specific type of business before and you don't feel like you really know that business very well, then I would run away and not do it. You know, if, if you, you know, if you've been, you know, uh, a consultant for Accenture in the IT side for 10 years, and then you just decide, I want to go be, uh, I want to own my own restaurant, and you've never run a restaurant or worked at a restaurant, I would say, don't do it. Go get your experience first before you put your money and other people's livelihoods at risk. So kind of really understand what business you're getting into. The neat thing was for me, um, I was from that industry. I, I had known it, but I didn't just come from a big company. When we started our company at ACC, <coughs> I was the person they sent out to begin the company in Canada. So I made like 34 trips up and down the QEW to Toronto for four years, hired the management team, got them going, and then went and did the UK and traveled back and forth to UK for two years and did the startup there and then did another startup in the US. So, and each business got from zero to 100 million in the course of a couple of years faster than the other one did. So I had like four startup experiences within the company that I was working at when AT&T bought us. So to do another startup was like, you know, same old stuff, no problem. Um, so you kind of want to make sure that you're that comfortable in a business that you're going to start up. That would be my suggestion to you. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Kate Wynn, University of Rochester Finance and Delaware Gifford County. First of all, thank you for coming. I love you too, man. My question is, do you have any company that you have emulated, or not copy, but mm -hmm. emulated to start your company? And also, do you have a current company that you look forward to to become an even better? Hmm. Um. Well, there's a lot of, I, I don't think there was a company that we emulated. We kind of took good parts from a lot of different companies. Uh, I will tell you, I'm really, um, uh, I, I really admire Wegmans, what they, how they deal with customers, how they deal with their employees, how they're uh, pretty innovative for such a large organization. Very impressed with their, their um, performance the last 20 years and keeping that entire focus on, uh, on helping their communities too. I mean, they're, they're, they're very good. Um, I really like um, some of the stuff Cisco does from a technology standpoint. Very impressed with them. Uh, we're a big client of theirs, a big partner of theirs. And we see them in, in good times and bad times. And we've been through two major downturns just in our little 12 year history. And uh, Cisco has been a company that could have really taken advantage of someone like us. And they did. Um, they were very good partners. And it's not so much your partners how they act when times are good, it's how your partners and suppliers act when times are bad. Uh, that really you know, shows the character of a company. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of companies that we admire and try to emulate little parts of. But I don't think like a pure just mirror image of someone. <coughs> One more question. Yeah. Um, where is your, what is your vision for your company for the next 10 years? Other than trying to keep it above water, of course. Keep it above water? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> glass half empty kind of check? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay, we'll have a fun. We have a 2020 plan. 2020 plan. In year 2020, my youngest, uh, Emma, is going to be finished college. So I'm retiring. <laughs> we're going to do something else. And in the year 2020, we want to be 20 billion in sales with over 20,000 employees with at least 20 bucks a share. 